this for our opening hymn this morning, hymn number 533. Count your many blessings. Amen. Neither death nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. For higher, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our hymn will be 248, down at the cross, number 248.
Mr. Cross, we realized this morning that we are weak with the Almighty. We ask you to continue to hold us in the palm of your hand. We ask you to look down on this city, Father, where there is still killing in the street. Look across this world, Father, where there is still wars and rumors of war. And we don't know when it's going to come to an end. Even this pandemic we hear. But we know all the answers lie in Christ Jesus. Father, we just thank you for watching over us from our earliest existence and bring us to this present moment. We move, we breathe, we have our bed because of you, Father. Father, we realize that as we move from here, we have so much to be thankful for, for our food that you provide, the shelter that we live in, the clothes that we wear, the jobs that we work on. Father, we ask you to bless us to look down those that may be suffering doing sickness and affliction this morning. Father, have mercy on those that are prison bound, and most of all, those who do not know you are the part of their sin. Father, let us stand up and tell the world that Jesus Christ lives and Jesus Christ saves. Father, you say in your word that if we lean not to our own understanding, that you will direct our path. And we stand here waiting on your direction, Father. We can't move until the Spirit comes. Help us to move at the Spirit's command, Father. Not only inside these walls, but once we leave here. Father, we come here to serve, but our worship begins once we go on the outside of the door. And Father, heal this land. You said if your people who are called by your name would humble themselves and pray, turn away from their wicked ways, Father, that you will hear from heaven and heal the land. And we cry out for healing, Father. We need you. We can't do it without you, Father. We put all our hope and all our trust in you, Father, realizing that one day, sooner or later, we're going to depart from this side. But you say, let not your heart be troubled. You have prepared a place for us, Father. So once we leave here, Father, we ask you to receive us in that place that you have prepared from the foundation, cross us over to a calm time. And at that time, we will ever <coughs> give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. These and other blessings we ask in the name of Jesus and Christ. Yes, sir. Amen.
because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. His compassions, they fail not. They're due every morning. And I'm crazy enough to believe because we serve a faithful God who gives us new mercies every morning. And even on the first Sunday morning in November, we ought to say, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Because his mercies endure forever. If you know you're living on new mercies, give God praise right now. Right, right, right. so St. Rex, good morning. Good morning. It feels like Sunday morning in here. And I'm grateful to God for it. How blessed to God we are to be back in worship one more time. I say, I'm glad to be in the service just one more time. Because the reality is he didn't have to let me leave. And when you look at what has happened already this morning, God has given you more blessings than you deserve. Sanctuary together, worship our God in spirit and in truth. Now, just to make sure that we welcome everybody to the sanctuary, choir stand, let's wave to the back, left, wave to the right. Let's welcome each other to the house of the Lord. How grateful we are to be together just one more time. Let me first of all acknowledge any visitors we have. If you're visiting with us for the first time or decide to come back and visit with us again, I'd ask you to stand where you are. Any visitors present with us? It appears we're all at home. I just want to make sure I don't overlook anybody. Thank God for us being back together as a family. Amen. Amen. And we're thankful for those who are watching by way of our live stream. We are grateful to God that we can connect both physically here on our campus and virtually through our live stream. We thank God for you. So glad to see so many faces present in the sanctuary. Sister Deborah, Brother Sterling, so glad to have you back in the fellowship with us. So glad to see you. Sister Higgins, Brother Greg, good to see you as well. We're grateful to God for you. Your presence here is a reflection of God still answering prayer. We are grateful to God for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Tuesday is coming and I want to encourage you to vote. Amen. I know a friend that I've met since I've been here. His name is Dr. Donald Tucker. He is the first African American to ever vote in Greenwood, Mississippi. As he was going to register to vote, because he had to take a voting test just to become a registered voter, even though he was born in this country, he was a citizen of this country, he had to take a test to register to vote. As he was walking back from registering to vote, policemen with a German Shepherd dog cornered him and attacked him. The German Shepherd dog bit him in his stomach and his thigh, ripped his pants and his clothes as he was just simply trying to register to vote. To this day, he walks with a limp because he fought for the right to vote. Yeah, yeah. We have other stories to tell beyond Donald Tucker. Yeah. We know of a Harry Blake. Mm -hmm. We know of a John D. Simmons and others who fought for our rights to vote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tuesday, please, ma'am, please, sir, do not desecrate the legacy of those who fought, was beaten, and died for our right to vote. We need to get out and make our voices heard. Yeah. It's amazing to me that we will complain for four years but not take four minutes to simply go to the ballot box and vote. In the effort that it takes to simply cast your vote, minutes, we'll spend years complaining about what should have happened, but don't take the same time to go out and vote. This Tuesday, if you have not done so, I'm encouraging you, please, ma'am, please, sir, go vote. I can't tell you who to vote for, but I will ask that you will be prayerful and will be conscious about your decisions as you go to the ballot box. This is a crucial election in the time of our city, in the time of our state and country. So don't complain about what happens in the days to come if you did not make your voice heard. Because silent voices can't make changes. Please, ma'am, please, sir, make your way to the ballot box as we are preparing for this election this coming Tuesday. Amen? Amen.
on another note, let me say happy anniversary, happy birthdays to those who are celebrating in the month of November. Y'all, the year is almost out. It has gone by quickly, but we thank God for those who are celebrating in this month of November. We pray that God grants you grace and favor in this new season of life and new season of love. On that note, on celebration note, next Sunday at 11 a.m., if the Lord wills, we will celebrate 137 years of God's faithfulness to our church. We will celebrate our church anniversary. Now, now, Brother Tony, when I mention church anniversary, don't turn the mic down. <laughs> Try it again. Next Sunday, if the Lord wills, we will celebrate our 137th church anniversary. How we thank God for that. God has been good to us as a church. God has been shown of good to us as a church. And this is a time for us to celebrate and thank God for everything he has done, not just in the past and present, but also thank God for the future that we still have as a church. The church of God is marching on. We shall not be moved. So we're going to thank God and celebrate next Sunday. Pastor Greg Oliver and the Mount Canaan Church will be with us. So I'm excited about Canaan Rest coming back together once again. And we will fellowship and tell God thank you for everything he has done in the life of our church. Let me also say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, St. Rest, for how you loved on me and my wife during our honorarium this past Sunday. It's been a wonderful two years of being your pastor, and there's no greater joy I have than serving you, the great people of St. Rest. I say it because I mean it. I love y'all, and ain't nothing you can do about it. I know that's bad English, but it's good theology because there's really nothing you can do about it. And I love you all because we have such a loving fellowship and partnership. Last Sunday was just a designated day, but the love that we share continues on throughout all year long. You are constantly praying and supporting me and my wife. You're constantly encouraging us, and I'm grateful to God for the service that you render to me as I render service to you. And I'm telling you, eyes ain't seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men the great things God is going to do as we continue to walk together as pastor and people. So buckle up, get ready, because it's going to be a fun ride. And I'm excited about it. As we come to a time of prayer, several prayer requests demand our attention. Let's continue to keep Sister Jackie Smith lifted in prayer. She is doing well, has now been moved to another rehab facility. And as I appreciate it, she's breathing better, breathing stronger, and getting well as she's progressing from major surgery. So we thank God for that. So please keep her and her family lifted in prayer. We also want to pray for uh, Sister Lanier, who's not feeling well today. We want to keep Deacon Lanier, Sister Lanier, lifted in prayer. As well as Sister Gladys Moore, Sister Ruby Larkins, uh, Deacon Caesar, and others who've been dealing with illness. And y'all, let's just pray for one another. Let's just pray for one another. I don't have to know your business to know you're going through. You don't have to know my business to know that I'm going through. But if we just talk to God about it, God will hear us and answer us according to his will. So at this time, I would ask you to stand where you are. Brother Chris, if you would be so kind, give me I need thee every hour. I want us to pray together. God is not hard of hearing. He can hear all of us at the same time. So as you stand, I would ask you would pray to God out loud and audibly that we bombard him for those things that stand in need of. When you are finished praying, you may return to your seat. Let's pray together, church. Let's pray, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Let's pray.
job of outlining Ephesians chapter 1 talking about how God picked us and really what I'm going to preach today is part B of that lesson. As we trek along in this month of celebration for our church anniversary I told us uh, last week during the afternoon service I want to preach a sermon series called Greater. Greater. If we think God is done with us we got to think again. Because God has not done with us both in the lives of us individually and the lives of our church. So I'm going to call your attention to Ephesians chapter 3. Familiar passage of scripture. From Ephesians chapter 3. For our time together, we'll look at verses 20 through 21. Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. I'm trying to hold my composure just by reading the scripture. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. If you have it, please respond by saying amen. amen. There the Bible reads, Now to him yes. who is able to do far more abundantly <laughs> than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within <laughs> us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is God's word. You may be seated. For the time that's ours to share, I want to tag this text, Greater Expectations. Greater Expectations. <laughs> Stories told of a lady who lived in the boondocks who had no electricity. She wanted electricity in her home, so she called the power company to see what could be done to get her house electricity. Yeah. 
They went out to survey her house and the land out where she lived, and they decided they were going to put a power pole there so she could get electricity inside her house. All right. They were able to set her up with electricity, make sure the wiring was good, everything was set for her to go. But after about six months, the power company noticed something very strange about the woman's use of electricity in her house. After six months, they discovered she only used one unit of electricity. She went to great lengths to get electricity in the house. But after six months of having electricity, she only used one unit. Yeah. It's obviously surprised the electric company, so they decided to send the service man out to her house to see what in the world was going on. So the service man knocks on the door, the woman answers, he asks, ma'am, are you using your electricity? Right. She said, well, yes, sir, I am. Uh, when it gets dark at night, I only turn the light on and keep it on long enough for me to turn on my kerosene lamp. <laughs> She had access to great power yep. throughout the house, yep. but she only settled for a kerosene lamp yep. because she did not understand what was available to her with the electricity in the house. Oh, oh. Access to a whole lot of power, yep. but settled for a little lamp because she did not have great expectations for the electricity in her house. I wonder how many of us miss out on the great blessings we have in our faith and in our salvation because we would rather settle for a kerosene lamp than for God to light the entire house. As we read Ephesians chapter 3, essentially the first part of Ephesians, Paul outlines for us the benefits we have from being connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you read the book of Ephesians, you will learn as a believer, you are blessed beyond belief because of what Christ did on Calvary. When Jesus Christ died, he provided for you a plethora of benefits that is made available to you the yeah. moment yeah. you receive salvation. Yeah. Yeah. Chapter 1, as Deacon Rogers outlined for us this morning, you'll learn that you are blessed because of the works performed by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That you are blessed both in your past, present, and future because of what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. Yes. Yes. Ephesians chapter 2, you'll learn that you are saved not by your merit, but you're saved by grace through faith. Because when you look at the pages of your own life, you were a dead man walking. Paul says you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. But God, who was rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved you, sent Christ to die for you, and by grace you have been saved. Then in chapter 3, Paul then also says that you're not only blessed personally because of Calvary, you're also blessed corporately because of Calvary. Because in the first part of Ephesians chapter 3, he commends the great mystery of the gospel is that Christ died to form the church. There were many factors in ancient times that kept Jews and Gentiles separated from the hour of worship. But when Jesus Christ died, he put away all the dividing factors that it did not matter if you were a Jew or a Gentile. As long as you believed in Jesus Christ, you now belong to this family called the church. And even today, as we commemorate this time of church anniversary, it does not matter if you are young or old. It does not matter if you are rich or poor. It does not matter if you vote Republican or Democrat. As long as you believe in the fact that he lived, he died. He was buried and rose again. You are now part of a great family of faith called the church. And it all happened 
because of what Jesus did at Calvary. So as you scurry in chapter 3, you'll see Paul pray this grand prayer for the church. He prays that they receive inner strength yeah. based on the salvation they have in Jesus Christ. He wants them to know the full length and breadth and width of God's love in their life. He wants them to be filled with all fullness in God. He prays a big prayer and then ends it by saying, now to him who's able. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it begs the question, Paul, you prayed this big prayer. Why do you conclude the prayer with this benediction or this doxology that says, now to him who's able. He has great expectations. Yeah. He expects God to show the love of Christ in the church. He expects God to fill the church with the fullness of God. And he ends the prayer by saying, now to whom is able. If you pray with this great expectation, yeah. Yeah. Paul, why do you end by saying now to him is able? Really, the answer is found in the argument he's making the entire time. He's praying this big prayer because he wants Christians to know both then and now, you should not shortchange God when you don't know how blessed you really are. That's right. That's right. It's a tragedy that we become stagnant in our salvation because we're unlearned about what it means to be saved. All right. All right. That we'll only be satisfied with the cross and think that the blessings we have start and end at the cross. Yeah. Yeah. That we only think we're saved and that's enough. But when you read the text, you'll discover the cross is the only entity that has both a stable foundation in a secure future. You are saved now because of the cross. You are being saved because of the cross and you will be saved because of the cross. Your past is covered, your present is secure, and your future is set all because of the cross. When you realize in totality what Calvary means, you'll learn to expand your expectations and trust God for more because God is not through working in your life. This text begs us to ask the question, is God done in your life? And if the answer is no, that means you need to have greater expectations for what God's going to do in your life. And I hear you, some of you saying, well, Pastor, I'm glad to be saved. I'm glad for you, too. Yeah. Because when you celebrate what God has done, that's a sign of history. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to look back every once in a while and think about the things that God has done in your life. When you celebrate what God has done, that's a sign of history. Yeah. But yeah. when you celebrate what God is going to do, that's a sign of hope. Yeah. And you should not be so infatuated with history that you have been robbed of the inspiration to hope. God invites us to divorce our infatuation with history and resolve to expect greater in our faith. The Clark sister said it this way, I'm looking for a miracle. I expect the impossible. I feel the intangible and I see the invisible. Why? Because the sky is the limit to so what I can have. If I simply just believe and receive it and trust God to perform it, he'll do it today. Church, you need to have some greater expectations. Because if God is not through with you, then you need to expect God to do more in your life. And the text shares with us how God invites us to have greater expectations. I pray that you did not close your Bibles because I don't want you to think I'm making this up. First of all, God invites you to have greater expectations by embracing the ableness of God. All right. You need to embrace the ableness of God. Notice how Paul begins this benediction, this doxology. He says, now to him right. who is able. Yeah. I wish we could shout off Bible alone if we just simply read it. Because that's enough for you to shout by itself. Now to him 
who is able. This phrase is used several times throughout the New Testament. He's used four times. There's another instance in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, where the Bible says, and God is able to make all grace abound towards every good work. Yeah, yeah. Romans yeah. chapter 16, verse number 25, Paul says, now to him who is able to strengthen yeah. you. Yeah. Even Jude uses it in that other famous doxology we know, where it says, now to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his great joy. Now to him who is able. And when you read this phrase in its context, you'll learn that every time this phrase is used, it's used in response to either a lack or a deficiency in human ability. For example, if you look at Jude chapter 24, verse number 24, where it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from falling. Previously, Jude says that you need to keep yourself in the love of God. But here's the reality of it you can't keep yourself. You, in your human ability, do not have the power to keep yourself. So Jude says, since you can't keep yourself, there's someone who is able to keep you when you can't keep yourself. So when we look at this phrase in Ephesians chapter 3, as Paul commends, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think, it's in response to the fact that he is seeking help for what he's already prayed for. He prayed that the church will be filled with the love of God, filled with the fullness of God, and understand the great links to God's love for them. And he understands the church can't do it by itself. The church in its human capacity does not have the ability to understand the fullness of God's love or the fullness of God. So he prays and says, since I know y'all can't do it, and I can't do it, I want to pray to the one who's able to do what no other power can do. Now to him who's able. And really he brings it home when he writes this in the original language because when you look in the original language of the text it does not say now to him who is able all 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 it says is him able and that should be the testimony of your life Paul is not writing this from a third person perspective he's writing this from a first person reality because he has history with God that has proven time and time again that God is able he is able to embrace the ableness of God because he knows God has proven history of being an able God. Yeah. By the time Paul writes this, yeah. Paul has already been on the Damascus road and he learned God was able to kick him off his high horse and get him back on his feet again. Yeah. Yeah. He's been shipwrecked. He's been beaten. He's been bitten by a snake. But God was able to deliver him from all of those yes. afflictions. Yes. So he's not telling you what he heard. He's telling you what he knows. God is able. Yes. And if you testify with me, I'll testify with you. When you look back over your life and see the pages of history that God has written, they ought to read God is able. Yes. How do I know he woke me up this morning? Yes. God is able. He put some food on your table. God is able. He put clothes on your back. God is able. He gave you transportation to make it to the house of prayer. God is able. He watched over you all night long. God is able. He protected you from danger seen and unseen. God is able. He's kept you in your right mind. God is able. And when you can't testify about what's happened, you can at least testify about the fact that one Friday on a hill called Calvary, he died God is And when you have proven history with God, you ought not have a problem embracing the ableness of God because you can testify that God is able. God is able. Now, I understand the issue we have with embracing the ableness of God when it comes to greater expectations. I understand. I really do. Because when you expect greater, 
The risk you run and expect the greater is you don't know all the details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you have greater expectations, they come with limited details and logistics. You don't know how it's going to work out, when or where it's going to work out. And we in our humane being love to be in control of the details. Yes. We want to know when it's going to happen, yeah. where it's going to happen, and how it's going to happen. Yeah. Because when we want something and we expect something, we want it to be done. And in order for it to be done in our minds, we have to know every detail of how it's going to get done. Yeah. And in the efforts of having greater expectations, we would rather be safe in the confines of our own mind, rather get lost in the will and safety of God's plan, because we want to know the hows of life. Yeah. But the tragedy is, when you don't know how, how can stress you out? All right. All right. When you try to put how in your hand, the howls of life can stress you out. Because all of us have been asking the same question for the past 24 months. How are we going to get out of this pandemic? How are we going to deal with inflation and a pending recession? How are we going to deal with this, this tense political climate where we don't know who's going to be in office? How are we going to make ends meet when we have decisions to make day after day? How Am I going to get over the loss of my loved one when grief has plagued my heart? How am I going to make it day by day when I do with those trifling folks at work from Monday through Friday? How am I going to deal with things that I don't know? But when you have proven history with God, you do not allow the hows to rob you of confidence in the one who is able. Watch the text. Paul prays this prayer that God grants them love and fullness of God's presence. All right. But Paul never trips out about how it happens. All, right. All he says is, now to him who's able. <laughs> That's one time for the father, I'm going to try two times for the son. He does not have the details of how the prayer is going to get answered. All he does is praise the one who's able to answer the prayer. One time for the Father, two times for the Son. This will make three times for the Holy Ghost. He does not know how the love of God is going to fill the church. He does not know how God will provide the fullness of himself in the church. All he does is says, now to him who's able. And church, you should not allow the hows of life and the concerns of the how rob you of confidence in the who. If you know who is able, it does not matter how because the how ain't your business. Because the how belongs to the who. And as long as him who is able is the one working it out, you shouldn't stress out about the how. All you know is him ain't able. So I don't know how you're going to make it out of this pandemic, but I know who's able. I don't know how you're going to deal with this sickness in your life, but I know who's able. I don't know how you're going to make it day by day, but I know who's able. That's why we used to say, surely, surely, surely he's able to carry you through. If there's anybody who knows he's able, you can holler back at me that you know God is able. I can move along, but I'm to help now. God invites you to embrace the ableness of his power. And he invites you to embrace God's ableness. But keep walking with me in the text because you also learn that in order to have greater expectations, God invites you to expand the capacity to trust God's work. All right. I'm not making it up, it's in the text. Because Paul says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Paul says, whatever you reason or request, God is able to do more. Yeah. Yeah, right. Whatever you ask or think, God is able to do more than that. Yeah. Whether it's work in you or work beyond you, God is able to do more than that. And he makes the argument based off how he presents the beginning of the chapter. He said, now listen, when Christ went to Calvary, y'all thought he was just there to save you from your sin. Yeah. Yeah. But he did more than that because he brought you together as a church. So because I 
I know that God is able to do more because he's done more based off what he's done in the past. I can pray this prayer because I know God can do more than I ask or say. That ought to shout you because you didn't think you could be saved. Yet you asked God to save you anyhow. And God did more than that when he saved you. God is able to do more than you ask or think. Whether it's in you or beyond you, God is able to do more than that. You may ask God to just give you some money to make it this week, but God is able to do more and pay all of your bills. You may ask God to keep you strong while you deal with this sickness, but God is able to do more and heal your body. You may ask God to give you some patience as you deal with this pandemic, but God is able to erase COVID-19. You may ask God to simply forgive you from those sins that you committed, but God is able to keep you from sinning. Whatever you ask or think, God is able to do more than that. And that's not just beyond you, that's also within you. That when you ask God for patience, God will do more than that and help you help other folks be patient. That right. you may ask God for wisdom, and God may do more than that and help you spread wisdom to somebody else. Yeah. That you may ask God to bridle your tongue, but God will do more than that and give you encouraging words yeah. to share with somebody yeah. else. You may ask God for some joy, but then God will make you a joy spreader. Yeah. God is able to do more both beyond you and in you, but here's the challenge of the text. All right. It's found in the next phrase in the verse. Yeah, right. Because Paul says God is able to do more, yeah. but it's according to the power at work within you. Gotta exegete the white space in order to understand what Paul is saying. Because notice, yeah. Paul does not say that God is able to do more according to the power that's within you. All right. He says God's able to do more according to the power at work yes. within yes. you. Yes. Which means God is able to do more, but the question is, will you let him do more? God has power to work both in you and beyond you, but the question is, are you willing to let him light the house, or are you going to settle for a kerosene lamp? Too often, we miss out on the great work of God, not because God isn't able to do it, but because we have not made ourselves available to receive the work that God wants to do in our lives. Brother Rogers, I've been in the TV business for about 10 years now, and I've done a whole lot of editing in my time in TV business. One thing I've learned, especially when it comes to editing videos, whether I do it professionally or even personally, is that if I don't have enough space on my computer, All right. the work will never get done. Yeah. <laughs> Got a couple people in here who will vouch that for me that the more you put on your computer, the less likely the work is to get done. I can have all the software I need to do the editing. Yeah. I can know all the buttons to press, but if I have too much stuff on my computer yeah. and not enough room yeah. on my computer, the work will never get done. Now the problem is not with the software because the software knows what to do. Yeah. The problem is not even with me allowing the software to do it. The problem comes because I haven't made enough space yeah. for the software to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. And how sad it is. We miss out on God doing work in our life because we have too much stuff and not enough space for God to work. And if you want to see God at work in your life, if you want to see that power, that Holy Ghost power work in your life, maybe you need to delete some files out of your system to help God do the work. Maybe you need to delete some pride, some files of arrogance or some pride selfishness. Maybe you need to delete your preferences so you can let God do the work. And when you get out of the way and make more capacity for God to do the work, you can shout, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the part of I am the clay. Mold me and let me after thy will. While I'm waiting, yield it and yeah. Yeah. You're going to have greater expectations. Yeah. God invites you. To expand your capacity to trust his work. Because God says, I'll be with you. God says, I'll never leave you. 
And God says, I'll fight your battles if you yeah. would only yeah. trust me. Yeah. I gotta go. I gotta go. I gotta go. Thank you for your patience. If you don't have great expectations, God invites you to embrace the ableness of God. All right. He invites you to expand your capacity to trust God's work. Third and finally, if you're going to have greater expectations, God invites you to express gratitude for what you expect. All right. I like verse number 21, Brother Carl. The reason why I like verse 21 is because Paul does not wait for the prayer to get answered right. in order to tell God thank you for answering right. the prayer. Yeah, yeah. He prays his big prayer. Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think. And he does not wait for God to give him an answer to the prayer. He simply tells God, thank you on credit. <laughs> There's no evidence in the text that suggests to us that Paul received an answer to the prayer he prays. Right. Yet he does not wait for God to move in order to tell God, thank you for what's about to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a common practice for us that we typically pray before we eat our food. All right. We'll ask God, Lord, thank you in advance for the food we're about to receive. Let it be nourished to our bodies. But when you go to your favorite restaurant or eat your favorite meal, that prayer becomes a little more exciting. All right. Because you know what to expect before you ever take a bite of the food. Yeah, yeah. When you know what you're about to eat, you know it's going to be good because you're at your favorite restaurant, yeah. you're eating your favorite yeah. meal. You know what's about to come. You know what to expect. You have no problem telling God, thank you for the food I'm about to receive. Thank you. That'd be nourishment to my body. You haven't taken a bite of food. You don't know if the food is hot or cold. All you know is because of what you expect. Yeah. You can tell God, thank you yeah. in advance. Yeah. And when you have greater expectations, it should not take God for you to move before he tells you thank you. Yeah. You just tell him, thank you in advance for what you're about to do. Because I know what to expect from the God who's in that's what he does in verse number 21. He doesn't wait for the prayer to come to pass. All he does is tell God, thank you in advance. Because he knows God's going to do it. How is God going to do it? He says God's going to do it corporately. He says to him be glory in the church. Yeah. Which means that God reveals his glory and answers Paul's prayer through the growth, development, and maturation of the church. Paul starts by saying the church was formed at the cross, but he ends by saying that the church doesn't stay at the cross. That God has a plan and a formula for the church to grow and develop. And since I'm praying for God to grow the church up, I don't have to wait to see it. I'm going to thank him for it in advance because I'm going to watch God work within the life of the church. And you ought to have the same shout in your own life especially in the life of our church because you know God is able to do it yeah. in the church. Yeah. And I'm not just talking about in the history of the church because when you look back at our history, we've got 137 reasons why we can tell God thank you. Because yeah. we've seen what he's done in the past yeah. Yeah. and we've seen what he's done in the present by keeping us as a church. But beyond that, we have testimony of how God has allowed stony hearts to become hearts of flesh. Yeah. How God has turned evil eyes into helpful holy eyes. How God has removed the bitterness out of some folks' life and bring joy into their life. And it happened in the church. Yeah. Yeah. You ought to tell God thank you. Yeah. And you see God move on the hearts of the people in the church because that's really what church growth is all about. Yeah. We love to shout about the fact that folks are coming to church and they're packing out pews, but what good is packed pews with ugly hearts? It makes no sense to have a whole bunch of folks that are going to raise hell in church. But when you got folks inside the church who can love one another, who can speak well of one another, and be kind to one another, and show love towards one another, that's growth in the church. That's how you show God's glory in the church. God's going to do it for but he also says that God's going to do it exclusively. Because he says to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Which means that as Paul is praying this prayer, Paul is putting it back on God. Now God, I want you to do it. All right. And since nobody else can do it, 
I'm trusting you to be the one to do it. Because I know you can do what no other power can do. So if it's going to happen, it ain't going to be me to get it done, God. It's not going to be the church. You have to be the one yeah, yeah. to make this happen. He doesn't mind giving God credit in advance for what God's going to do because he knows God has a track record of doing things by himself to get things done. Yeah. Yeah. You look at the story of the Bible. God has a good track record right. of doing it by himself. Yeah. When the Hebrew boys were in a fiery furnace, right. God did not dispatch heaven's firefighters or the heavenly fire department. No, God got in the fire by himself with the Hebrew boys and walked them out of the fire. When, when, when Moses was in need of a deliverer at the Red Sea, God did not wait for heaven to dispatch some angels. No, he got in that rod and he'll part the Red Sea and watch Pharaoh drown in the Red Sea. And on that hill called Calvary, when we needed a savior, God did not dispatch or others, he said, I'm going to do it by myself. He sent his son from 40 and 2 generations to die on the rugged cross for our sins. And let you know that God can do it by himself. And you can testify in your own life. The doctors may have prescribed your illness, but God was the one who healed you. The bill collector was looking for your money, but God made the way. The professor said that you will fail the class, but God got you across that graduation line. Is there anybody here that knows can do it by himself. God's going to do it corporately. God's going to do it exclusively. And God's going to do it eternally. Now, Brother Piper, I struggle with how to close this sermon. I really do. I struggle with how to close this sermon. Because I could have closed with that word amen. I really could have closed with that word amen that if you have greater expectations and you trust God to do more in your life your response ought to be amen because you're not trusting God with a maybe you're trusting God with a show enough so your response ought to be amen but as I look at this text what struck my attention was this phrase throughout all generations forever and ever and the reason why it struck my attention is because Paul is praying a prayer that goes beyond his own life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Paul prays a prayer that he may not be alive to see. All right. But he does not allow his lifetime and his lifespan to rob him of greater expectations yeah. because he understands even though I may not be alive to see oh. him, there's somebody coming behind me that's going to be the answer to my prayer. Yeah. 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 So God, I'm trusting you with this big prayer. And I may not be alive to see it, yeah, yeah. but that generation's coming after me yeah. that's going to be a testimony to answer prayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you look at the storyline of St. Rest, that's really the testimony of our church. Yeah. It started with Pastor Samuel way back in the day, but it did not end there. Because yeah. there was more generations coming oh. to see answered prayer. It continued with John B. Simmons and his legacy, but it did not end there. Because there were more generations coming. It kept on going with Pastor Walton, but it didn't stop there because there's more generations coming. Pastor Moore was here, but it did not stop there because there's more generations coming. And even as I stand here right now, it ain't going to stop with me because there's more generations coming. So you may not be allowed to see it, but you want to thank God for it because God will still meet your expectations beyond your life. How do I know? One side. On a hill far away. God met some expectations that some folks weren't alive to see. He promised Adam and Eve a redeemer in the garden, but they were not alive to see it. He promised Ruth a kinsman redeemer, and she wasn't alive to see it. Yes. But God still met her expectation. Yes. He promised the prophets that he would be wounded for our transgressions. Yes. That he would be bruised for our iniquities. Yes. The chastisement on our peace was on him. Yes. And by his stripes we are healed. Yes. But they weren't alive to see it. But God met their expectations. Because one Friday on a hill far away, Jesus died, uh, didn't he die? He died uh, for your sins and mine. He died uh, to meet great. 
with expectations. He died about to take the sting out of death. And uh, he died uh, to take victory out of the grave. Is there anybody here uh, that knows my Jesus died? They took him off the cross uh, and laid him in Joseph's borrow tomb. Uh, but early, I said This has been the day of great expectation that God can save you from your sin. It's so simple. Acknowledge that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe in what Jesus Christ has done at Calvary. Confess with your mouth and believe in your mouth. And he raised him from the dead. You too can be saved. This is not about church membership right now. This is about kingdom fellowship. We want to make sure that you're on your way to heaven if you are here without the Lord Jesus Christ, we invite you to come back to spirit.
peace of God that surpasses all understanding guards hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. People of God respond together by saying amen. Amen.